Welcome everyone to the Yure, uh, uh, I think people are hello, ready. Hello, hello. Hey, good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, nice to see you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it's my pleasure to introduce the invited speakers for the session, Professor Yurai Homkovich and Dr. Regula Lachar. Um, Yurai Homkovich is a professor of information technology and education at uh, ETH Zurich. Um, born in Bratislava in Slo Slovakia, um, Yurai did his uh, PhD in 1986 and its habilitation in 1989 from the Cornelius University in, um, Bratis in um, Slovakia. And he was in uh, Paderborn, Kiel, and Aachen in Germany as professor before moving to Zurich. It was my pleasure to overlap with uh, Uri in 1996 in uh, Kiel. And he was an eminent researcher in parallel algorithms. As I, That's how I knew him. And in fact, uh, I know him principally as a writer of remarkably clear textbooks. And uh, this is, I think, you know, to many areas in uh, computer science, he has brought, uh, I would say, a paradigm of clarity in his writing. Um, so he's got many awards in 2015. He got the Slovak uh, State Award, the Goodwill Envoy Award. In 2017, he got the Probina Cross from the president. Um, and then uh, he's worked on um, algorithm, algorithmics for hard problems, complexity theory, especially looking at notions of randomness and non-determinism. He has written, as I said, remarkable textbooks. He founded the Center for Computing Science Education at Zurich in 2005. And uh, he was instrumental in starting the Laird Diploma in Informatic in um, Zurich again, which is like the B.Ed. program for inform computer science that we would think of. And uh, so he has been a leader in uh, thinking about computing science education. And uh, as I said, uh, his remarkable work is writing textbooks from for children in the kindergarten to all the way doing graduate studies. So I think it's a great pleasure to have Yurai and Regula here. Regula Lacher is also at ETH. She's the director of uh, ABZ. Uh, it's a consortium for producing materials for teachers. She's written eight textbooks, and uh, she's developed, been instrumental in developing the IT curriculum for K-12 there, and uh, co-author of the series of uh, the so-called Bieber cards. It was my pleasure to, you know, get a set and look at them in uh, what, whatever little German I could understand. And uh, she's been designing tasks in the Bebras uh, Challenge and in the Beaver competition. And in fact, she has uh, won some awards for her design of tasks as well. And so it's a pleasure to have uh, Uri and Regula here at the CETUS conference. A warm welcome to them. And uh, <laughs> so uh, this session, we are going to have a talk on what is computer science. The teaching computer science, the three roots of computer science, as Yurai calls it. Um, looking forward to the talk. Over to Regula and uh, Yurai. Okay. So hello, everybody. Have a nice morning. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So I prepared the first talk to be somehow general. And there are two main reasons for that. The first one is the history of computer science education is a history of many mistakes. We know that in many countries, and it is still the case in some of the countries, the teaching computer science is, is reduced to computer driving license. And this is definitely not what we aim. But there is one more important reason to speak today about what computer science is and, and how to teach it. And the reason is that my opinion is that uh, the education as a well whole is again changing in some quite fast evolutionary process. And I would like to express the idea. I mean, to be able 
to follow some pattern and to do something has in this time smaller and smaller value, smaller and smaller value for the education. And the reason is, is clear. We have exactly computer science. We have artificial intelligence inside of computer science. So everything what we know how to do, we can automate. Okay. So what we have really to force in the schools, this is the creativity, to ability to discover something, critical thinking, to the ability to create something. So it means our our main philosophy in teaching at all, not only in computer science, is don't teach the products of computer science. Sorry, the products of science. It means don't teach only facts, CRMs, models, methods, technology, and how to use them. Teach the processes of their discoveries. And if you think now about teaching computer science, we could be a pattern showing other subjects how to work. And this is the main reason why I'm now trying to tell something which is put in a very general framework. Okay, so you see the first slides. Our first question is, what is computer science? And my first goal is to say, take care. This is not something very new, question of a few years or maybe 50 years. Computer science is a very old discipline, as old as the human culture, so many thousands years. Okay, so let us start with this. Uh, regular? Regular. Ich kann Page down. Das Bild nicht bewegen. Page down. Yeah. Okay, we have some problem with presentation, but okay, now we go. Um, so, I will start with three rules of computer science. So, if you think an, on a short definition of computer science, the shortest one I know is that computer science is a science about automized information processing. Okay? And there are two crucial words in this definition. Information and automation. Okay? So let us start with the term information, which means also data representation. So let us look on the first big data crisis in the old Mesopotamia. Why I'm speaking about big data crisis there, the definition of of big data crisis is need, not a definition about how many terabyte memory you need to save your data. Big data crisis means that you have technology that is not sufficient to analyze data and to work with data you have. And this was exactly the case. Think about it. You have one country with about 1 million inhabitants. I know it is very small in compared to, to India now, but, but anyway, in that time, this was the biggest countries of the world. And they have to make some management. So there were taxis at that time, properties and things like that. And the only possibility, the only possibility to save the information was the mind of the officers. And for sure, the country was really in big crisis because of that, because his officer forgot something, it was different. Okay? And the main reason to develop the first script, the first written language, was the management of the country, not the ability to write books. Okay? And if you think about the development really on the history, 
It took 2,000 more years until people were able completely to write the spoken language. But these 2,000 years, the people use written language to develop database for managing the country. And if we speak today about digitalization, please think about the definition of what a digital representation of information is, and it is nothing else, a sequence of symbol of an alphabet. So it means the process of digitalization definitely started that time. Okay, so if I go to this term information data representation, I try to say the computer scientists are specialists in developing scripts or written languages. So why? Let us think about it. Um, secret codes, okay, developing secret codes. This is 4,000 years old history, okay? Now, we speak today about information density and compression. But think about that. Already at the very beginning of human cultures, we had the question of compression. Because, you know, you were asked to write everything what you decide to write, for instance, on the stone. And this was a lot of work. So the people, for instance, in number representation, tried to develop number representation that is short. This was the compression of all time. We know the history of self-verifying causes, maybe not so old, but, but it's very important today. We try to represent data in such a way that if you have some errors in it, that can happen by writing the data or transporting the data, that you are able automatically to let the data discover. The decal. So, and if I have to tell you something about what computer scientists really do, then think about following. What we really do is we represent the information as data and we try to find such a representation that we are able to efficiently handle the representation. Okay, so, and to all these examples are the numbers, okay? Many different cultures develop many different number systems. But why we have today the decimal system, not only because we have 10 fingers, but simply for that reason, the representation is short, but still more important, we are able to handle numbers, it means to calculate efficiently, exactly at basis with this system. So it means the whole history of number representation about more than 5,000 years, what a history to find a representation with which we are able to work efficient. Okay. So let us go to the second route, automation or algorithms. I think automation is also something I cannot really date because the original way to automize looks like that. The people acquire knowledge, okay, and use this knowledge to develop procedure, how to reach some goals, okay? And what is important on this story, if the humans develop some procedure, other humans were able to use it, to execute it, and to reach the goal without understanding why it works. They did not need to have the knowledge of people who discovered it. This was the automation from the very beginning. And on the other hand, if we think on algorithms as description of such procedure in, in, in sense of exact language of mathematics, we know that we have already 4,000 years old plate from Mesopotamia describing algorithms. 
So the history of algorithm is very long one. Okay. So maybe to to go a little bit in communication, I have here the theorem of Pythagoras on the screen. This was a technology in antique time, in ancient time even. Do you know why? Why Pythagoras and how Pythagoras was used in that time? It was not discovered by Greeks. You find tables with this equality already in, in all Babylonian plates for 4,000 years. So is somebody willing to start a communication? <laughs> Why I say this, this theorem was a technology? Well, nobody wants to speak with me. This is not very good. I usually <laughs> force the students to speak with me in any event I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, somebody, please. Okay, okay. I will I will continue. Okay. So if you want to build houses or any kind of buildings, you need the right corner. And this was the way how to do it. Okay? You take for instance a rope of the length three, four, and five, build a triangle, and you know that you have a rectangle there. Okay, this was the use of Pythagoras in architecture in all time. Okay, and maybe everybody knows these two very old books, the books of Euclid Element, Elements, okay, and the book of Al Khwarizmi. So both these books contained already exact mathematical description of algorithms. So what I want to say with this is only algorithmics is an old scientific discipline. Okay, the last kernel we want to optimize, we need the technology for sure. If you look at the history of the machines, you see here uh, one example of Leibniz uh, calculator is more than 300 years old. The first machine you can program, so the first universal computer is the analytic engine from Babbage. And as also you may know, the first human who used to program is the lady Ada on this computer. But maybe this history is not so old. But if you look on the network technology, then the history is again a few thousand years old. Because the very basic of all communication is nothing else than to be able to work with signals and to code information as a sequence of signals. So this is the relation to digital representation, but now you don't have symbol of an alphabet, but you have physical signals you are able to create and send. But all the history of networking is based on this principle up to now. We are only faster on this is everything. Okay, why I I used to speak about this? My message is very clear. Computer science is an old discipline that was ever an integral part of human culture. Okay. And let us start with this point and think about this. What should be the main goals of teaching computer science? So, I formulating the following three ones. Usually, 
I don't know how it is in India, but anyway, in the most country I know, one of the main goals of the school is to understand the world. Okay? And in, say, in the case of computer science, I add to that, not only to understand the world we created, the world of technology, but also to be able to contribute, to, to control it, and to be able to contribute to its development. Okay? So the second goal, if we teach computer science properly, we will support teaching of mathematics and languages. I will explain more into the detail later. And the third point is that we would like to bring to the school again more constructive work. Okay, so let us go more into the details with these three goals. This is more a few uh, political questions I was confronted many times in my life. Why to have computer science as a school subject and not to let it to university for specialists? One reason I told you already, if you want to understand the world today, there is no way around. You have to teach computer science. But another reason, at least as important as the first one, is the following. We know how life is changing now. Everything, what we understand, and unfortunately sometimes even if we don't understand, we optimize. Okay? This means automation is part of our life. And if the pure, we don't know how the jobs will look like in the future. But what we definitely know, that in each professionality, the people must be able to work with automation, must be able even to be productive in this direction. So if you want to be successful in your job, you have to understand the automation processes. And this is the reason why computer science must be a part of general education. Okay, I will not read this now, but only say it is not only about the knowledge of the computer science subject, it is also about the ability to live in the society with responsibility. Because if you don't understand these processes, you are even not able to take part in election when we discuss the question what we have to do with the technology and what we are not allowed to do with the technology. So, in fact, not to teach computer science means to go in the dependency also in the political issues. Okay, now let me go to the second goal, fostering the competency in mathematics and languages. I think I don't know what it, I, I, I see that it is not so easy to communicate with you because you don't have microphones and this is very hard for me because I usually try to deal with everything with my audience. But anyway, let us think, what is mathematics? And I will tell you the following. Mathematics is a research instrument. We have only two research instruments. One is experiment, and another one is mathematics. Okay? And mathematics has been developed as a language, as a language with special properties. The first property was everything what is formulating in this language has only one unambiguous interpretation. This was necessary to get objectivity in computer science and the communication. 
And the second requirement of this language was everything what is formulating this language or every argumentation in this language can be verified, whether it is correct or not. Okay? So in this way, mathematics has been developed as a research instrument. People use the mathematics to describe the world and then to investigate the world inside of mathematics. And they were trustable because they were able to verify each argumentation. While speaking about this, if you look on mathematics, the only one, two crucial goals of teaching mathematics are to teach abstraction, it means to be able to transform the reality into the language of mathematics. And the second one, if you formulated your problem or your relationship in the language of mathematics, you want to solve them. So you want to develop methods, solution methods, or in another word, you want to develop algorithms. These are two main goals of mathematics abstraction, and fostering problem solving. And now look on computer science. What are the main goals there? You cannot start automation without abstraction, because first of all, you have to describe everything in the sequence of symbols. And then you look for algorithms, because you want to automize. So, these two main goals of computer science overlap completely with the two main goals of mathematics. And this is one reason I say, if you teach computer science properly, you support a lot of mathematics and you can do it also vice versa. Okay, why computer science is so much related also to languages? Maybe this is not so obvious. So let us think about this. I told you already that developing new scripts for different purposes is a part of computer science. Okay? So it means if you develop written language, you have some expertise in languages. But let us think also about another part. We used to teach programming. Programming language is definitely a language. And we, if we do it properly, we offer something to languages what they unfortunately don't do. And this is the following. When we teach language programming languages with pupils, we work as follows. We take a very small vocabulary. It means less than 10 instructions and try to write programs in such a way that, that this is enough to describe the activity they want to reach with the program, okay? After some time, the pupils recognize that the language is pure. It is not easy to do complex things with that. And then we start to teach pupils how to explain the computer no words, and then they are allowed to use these new words in the programming language. So it means in this way, the pupils develop the programming language, each one an individual one, and test it, and then they use it to program. Okay? So it means in this way, you do something you don't have opportunity to do really in, in language courses. You can develop your language, use it and test it, okay? And for all the pupils in the high school, we even allowed to develop the grammar and they really developed the whole language, starting with the grammar and then with the vocabulary. Okay, and for sure, everybody knows, it, what is a program? Program is nothing else than description an ambiguous description of an activity. 
and the computers is able to execute the program only in the case that everything is correct. One syntactical error is enough and the program does not work. So what we train here is to communicate precisely what to do or how to describe an activity. Okay, I don't want to speak too much about that because I would like to come back to this topic in the didactic issues. But anyway, we have we want to have more constructive work in the schools. This is the first goal I mentioned already. So let us went to to didactical concept we have. Um, everybody knows the constructivism of Jean Piaget for sure, but I would like to to call attention to the genius uh, sentence of Samuel Papert, learning by getting things to work. What does it really say? It say following, learning in the following process. You start to create something. This something could be a program, this something could be a secret code, this something could be a self-verifying code, whatever you produce. But you don't finish your learning process by creating the product. After you create a product, you start to investigate the properties and the functionality of the product, getting new ideas. What? Okay, first of all, you can look whether it works correctly and try to correct if necessary. But you can get also ideas of what you can do better, how to reach a better product, what are the weaknesses of the product. And you come back and start to create a new one. This is the very natural way how we all humans are working, the whole history. And this has to come to the school because it is completely wrong to teach products of science there and to memorize and to work with it because the natural process of working and this means also the natural process of learning is process like as I described. Okay, so the important point here, the new one is test and analyze the product of answer to get new motivation. The another starting point for our didactic thinking is for sure the critical thinking, which is very much related to that what I told you already. And at the very end, if we speak about this whole didactic around, okay, we came again to my starting point. The recent educational system are speaking about skills or competencies, okay? And many people are puzzling what it is really about, but I would like to tell you what it is. It is definitely not the ability to, to learn some pattern, how to wear, to learn some effort, and to be able to apply this method for particular examples to find a solution. This is not a skill. This is not what we are searching for. What we are searching for is true expertise. And expertise means that I don't only understand how a method works, I acquire knowledge and experience, and I am able to use this knowledge and experience in new situation. I am able to do something reasonable with what I learned in new situation, to be creative, to, to search for new solutions, 
to extend the methods I learned. This is the future of education, because in all things what we can optimize, the technology will overtake the work. We are not needed anymore, and we are not able to develop in this direction where the creative work that AI cannot do for us. If this creative work, we will be strong. Okay, so this was something about our philosophy that, as you may know, uh, as was already mentioned, we wrote a series of 18 books, uh, which is are partially for pupils, partially for teachers, about how to teach computer science in curricula, starting from kindergarten up to the end of the high schools. And uh, in the workshop that will follow this lecture after one and a half hour approximately, we will show you two examples how you can start some topic in kindergarten and how to continue with this topic up to getting some mastery at the level of high school. Okay. And I will show two such streams. And then we can also have discussion about many, many things because we can offer a lot of things. I think I, I, I sent some of the examples of the books already to your communities or probably you will have a possibility to log on that. Okay, so thank you for your attention. And now I am ready for questions. I don't hear you, I don't hear you. I don't hear you. Now, now is good. No, 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 I don't hear you. But now, um, yes. yeah, it's the stage is open for questions now. On uh, the very nature of computer science, and uh, uh, anyone, I can see some listings. Yeah. Okay. So while the people are thinking about, I want to ask you something about uh, the way you know computer science is envisaged in uh, schools. One problem that. Uh, even after understanding it as uh, algorithms, right? That is one widespread misconception is that it's about um, teaching algorithms, you know, teaching specific algorithms. Um, how do you find that in, in your development? I mean, uh, uh, often it ends up teaching specific algorithms for a particular task rather than the kind, you know, uh, algorithmic thinking. So how do you... Uh, distinguish that when you work with teachers and in the system? Okay, so what I definitely try to avoid is that I explain an algorithm and the only one goal is to be able to execute the algorithm. Yeah. This has a, I can do it, but this has relative low educational value. So I can explain you how, how we work with this. I have two approaches. Uh, uh, there is still one more question. If you decide to teach concrete algorithms, which one and why? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the disadvantage of concrete algorithms is the following. There are typically so much specialized on the problem that if you change a little bit the problem specification, the algorithm does not work. These are all weaknesses from the educational process. Exactly. So there are two points I would like to mention now. First one, I try to teach, okay, algorithms are, okay, <laughs> still before that. The question is also when, for which age. Yeah. 
Algorithms is something very complex because it is a method that works for infinitely many problem instances. For infinitely many cases, should work correctly. Mm. You cannot start with this and with small children. Forget about this. Yeah. Because this 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 universe are quantified is very very hard. Yeah. Okay. So what we do with small children is definitely we we give problem instances and let them solve them by by head. It's simply to try and to get some idea about strategies, but not about algorithms. So we really used to teach algorithms in high school, but not before. Okay. And now these two points. One point is. Try to use general methods for developing algorithms. I mean, something which worked in in in, in many situations, almost universal, not really universal, but almost. I mean, if I have to say examples, one example is backtracking. I am able to see all solution and go through and look for the best one. This would be something like that. I can do greedy algorithms because greedy concept is quite easy and well understood. Okay, I can use local search, for instance. I can use divide conquer. Maybe the more easy way is in my new yes. book will come soon. is is based only on constructive induction. Mm -hmm. The constructive induction is is very easy. The easiest part of divide and conquer because it starts with the idea. If I know how to solve the problem of size n, I have only to develop a strategy how to go from this solution for size n to the solution to size n plus one. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. This is induction, yeah. very easy. We have a lot of nice examples. And then it, the game changed because we show the power of this method by some examples and then give the put the problems and ask the pupils to develop the algorithm by themselves. And this is the goal. Mm -hmm. So they learn some way how to search for a good algorithm, yeah. and then they have to get problems and develop the algorithm by their own. Yeah. And dynamic programming is, is on the very end of the high schools if you want to try, but it, if you do it properly, it simply out works as well. So this is one way that you try to focus on on, I will say, robust strategies and train the pupils in such a way, give examples of algorithms, but then ask to develop algorithms with the strategy for other problems. Yeah. Okay? Oh, yeah. I... And another approach is that you really want to develop a concrete algorithm for concrete problem, for instance, Dijkstra, for shortest paths, is very popular and mm -hmm. important, okay? So what we do in such cases is, 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 is a word like that. We give the pupils some problem instances and ask to find a solution yes. by scratch. Absolutely. Okay? And maybe to develop some strategy. Either they develop some strategy, or if not, they propose some strategy, and then ask the pupil to find problem instances where the strategy does not work. Right, right, right. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they recognize this, oh, it's still not general, here it does not work, so I have to think about. And we start this process with, with, with trying to make a proposal, then prove that it does not work, with some counterexample, until we reach some nice idea, we are able to formulate all together and get somehow the algorithm. Okay, so this is the way how we teach algorithms. Um, I, I think I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, I agree that it's not about learning specific algorithms, but to think and develop algorithms. But I have a uh, point to, you know, take with you on this. Um, isn't there already some damage done at the elementary school uh, when they learn math, right? I mean, you learn specific algorithms for multiplication, for division, and in fact, you know, children grow up thinking algorithm means, uh, you know, math, and you're taught some particular thing to do, you learn that, and that's it. I mean, you don't learn many ways of doing multiplication or division or any of these. I right? do, I do. I know, I mean, <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know, but this is what I mean by the damage that is done in the elementary school. So, what is your 
I mean, how, do you find that so, or how do you? Uh, I, okay, I am now writing a book, How to Teach Math in uh, First Four Classes. <laughs> yes, uh, I did, okay. Cool, I think. Yeah. It's exactly about this topic. Yeah. And I can tell you how, how we do it. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> we say, we teach arithmetic today in a wrong way. Yeah. Oh, and I tell you why. We take a number representation as given, yes, and then we learn to manipulate symbols in this representation. Absolutely, yep. this is a definitely wrong way. Yep. What I do with the children first, I work with them on developing number representations, mm -hmm. different ones, mm -hmm. and I have a very nice way how to come to decimal system. I can tell you very quickly. Okay. The first point is how people started to represent numbers. It was nothing else. Then you say, this, this is the value you have to pay, mm -hmm. and you have some system of coins, mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. And the number representation is set of coins you need to pay exactly this value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you will get many representations, right. OK? Because you can pay the value in different ways. So the right representation is the, that one that pays with smallest number of coins. Okay? And you need... So mm -hmm. what, what the pupil learn here is okay. they can represent the number by really adding the values of the coins and then minimize by exchanging smaller one for equivalent larger one. Okay? okay? Yeah. This is something which is important later also for the arithmetics. Because in the addition, you do it, in fact. Yeah. And then I teach the pupils first to, to work with coins, even to make the addition with the coins, because it's very simple. You put the coins together, yeah. and then you minimize the number of coins. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And after that, I develop with them the Egyptian representation, which was the representation coming before our position representation, and this is, you take the pictures of all coins you have, so one, ten, hundred, thousand, you know, the Egyptians have special symbols for that, okay? And then, below them, you... You make a dash? You, you make a, so many dashes of any, ah, yep. many coins uh -huh. of that kind you have, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And then you start to work with this representation, and after some time you say, okay, don't work with dashes, we can introduce new alphabet, new symbols for zero, one, up to nine dashes, and, and to put these new symbols there, and you develop the representation. But you understand all that in this board very well what is addition and subtraction, okay? Yeah. And then you can continue in this way, yeah. The advantage of all this is also that if you one time decide to introduce the binary system, even pupils in the class further forward have absolutely no problem because it is the same principle. You have to okay. pay some amount of money and you have to minimize the number of coins you use. Yeah. Does not matter which system you take. Mm -hmm. All system used to work in this way. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, this is the sort of thing that I wanted. Uh, there is a question from behind. And yeah. Can you? Oh. Come on. Yeah, getting out of this place is hard when you are. Yeah. I don't know if you can, can hear. So. Is that clear now? OK. Um, thank you, Professor. So you started mentioning. The use of history, uh, giving a background of the historical uh, development of tech, so to say, before teaching computer science, right? And to say that this has been around for a long time. Uh, coincidentally, uh, I was having a chat with somebody here, uh, you know, one of the water cooler conversations at the conference, and um, they mentioned that history is again something that we've, uh, as teachers, successfully managed to. Um, uh, make less interesting for children for whatever reasons. Have you ever found that being something that 
you know um, children have not been very receptive to have found boring for example like when you start off by saying you know uh, when people built pyramids they had this problem and so they wanted to build a stick and so somebody you know came up with pi in circumferences and all of that okay uh, can you summarize yeah uh, the, the, may i ask for short summarization yeah, because the, the question is about history and uh, you you were, you started with the history but how do we make this uh, historical awareness important and exciting to children that that the kind of not just the concept but the history of the concept i think that is the that well, to make it interesting to children okay i i mean my view is that if you don't study the history of a scientific discipline you don't understand the discipline because the discipline is the genesis of the discipline it is the genesis of thinking in this discipline this is one point but it is still one more important one which is of the didactic nature i told you that we try to teach the processes of discoveries and not the result of discoveries and then you have really to understand this because usually the history offers you very nice understandable way how to teach something i can i try to follow the history in such a such way that i even take the mistakes from the history let the pupils do them and learn from these mistakes the mistake is not an error this is different point okay you, it is not about making errors it is about trying not succeeding and learning from that and trying better next time and i tried to bring this process in the schools and knowing the history helps me a lot for that wonderful it also gives the stories to tell right so yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe next um, Yes, is 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 using small steps. Yes. Yeah. Am I audible? Am I audible? Okay. I just go back. Uh, f uh, maybe five minutes back, Professor Ramanujam had talked about uh, um, the damage that is done in schools through wrong ways of teaching and making children cram certain processes or algorithms, and uh, and and soon after an exam is over children forget those because they're not deeply engaged with anything at all they just cram something a process in but and uh, is this damage done and can we do something about it so my experience is that even if the damage is very deep and even if the children have gone to far higher grades uh, already with that kind of uh, learning or uh, non learning that they have been through still my experience and the experience of our whole team is that if you uh put children in a different uh, context in a different scenario and when you make them engage with the same kind of concepts mm -hmm. uh, in a more sensible scientific manner it is instantaneous that they connect with a much better way of learning and then they start this is they, they it just sparks their learning and all that damage that was done is can easily be recovered not maybe easily because time has flown by but the children can engage and can deeply engage with the um, with the new way of learning and they can come out on top so do you agree with this or uh, or i hope he does otherwise <laughs> i won't let him continue <laughs> yeah you're right uh, she's saying that you know um, i was talking about this damage that is done and uh, the fact you know the confidence that it can be undone and it can be uh, you can recover from uh, even if children have learned specific things through memorization or whatever we can uh, undo that and get them to reflect and work on algorithms in the sense that we are talking about i i i am not sure that i understood everything acoustically again but i think i i i i i can say something to that i think one of the mistakes of the schools sure. is this kind of training uh, where you say okay this is the task or oh, this was correct this was wrong speaking about errors 
is somehow dangerous because then the pupils are trained to do everything correctly, not to avoid errors, and then they are not willing to try to do something because they are aware of possibility of making mistakes. So what we have really to change in the system is that it is natural for the pupils to try to do something, not to succeed, but to learn from that, and then try again, and then at the very end reach the goal and be satisfied with this. So they have to, to, to view it as something very natural, not as something bad if they don't succeed. I think this is what, what this process has to change as well. Oh, that would be wonderful. I mean, I think that would be the most fundamental transformation of all our classrooms if we can uh, have the freedom to fail, freedom to try and fail, right? And learn from our failures. Yes. Um, I think one next question. Yeah. Uh, I had one question. In this um, formulation of the three roots of computer science, how does uh, the ethics of computing and resource constraints, how does how does that fit in, or where does it fit in? Uh, uh, because uh, all that, how do you know what something to be even computing or not? And there is also this assumption that there is this endless resources with which we are working. Is that somehow factored in into these roots of computer science, the way you uh, laid it out? So the question was on ethics. How do, you know, in, when you're presenting your roots of computer science, how does the ethics of computing, what to compute and why, and uh, resource limitations, this idea of uh, that there are limits to resources, do they fit in, in your view of what computer science is? Okay. Not just what you compute, but why you compute, perhaps. Yeah. And how much? And how because, much? Because uh, if there is a constraint, then how much? Okay. I, uh, okay. So I, I don't like the term computer science. First, I would like to say I like the word uh, informatics because computer science is not science about computers. <laughs> but but I, I understand the question as, as the question of is, is related to ethic of, of, of this whole technology. Yeah. Is this true? Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah, I think this is not an easy question because we don't know what will come next. Uh, but, but anyway, I would like to say following. Not all questions related to that are news. One point are data, okay? We... The, the human have data for a thousand years, not only today. And how to work this data was always a critical issue. Okay? The only dis distinction, distinction to, to, to recent time is uh, that you can distribute the data very quickly and massively today. This strengthened the problem. But what is correct and not, we have really to define and not, it's not only the question of the subject of computer science, I think this is really the question for the whole society. But on the other hand, I understand you have also probably the question, what we are allowed to do with this technology? This is the same question as you have in the physics, what you are allowed to do with atom physics, okay? And, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know whether the question is how to integrate this issue in teaching computer science or how to work it with it in, in general. I think what we computer scientists can offer is a good understanding what can be done, what are the limits, and what are the possibilities, what we can do, and then open the question, what are the related risks? But the answer has to come from the whole society, not from us. This is my view on that. Yeah. Okay, so... Thank you, I think... Uh, well, you're right, you have made us all hungry, and I think we have to... 
head for lunch now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so thanks very much for a deeply thought-provoking um, uh, lecture. And uh, I think we have made us think about many fundamental issues on uh, what computing is. And thanks very much for that. And uh, we'll meet uh, right after lunch for the workshop where we want to see more of these activities in this. So let's give you a, a big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, see you soon. Yep, see you. <laughs> okay. I hope you get some coffee or something. Well, yeah. Okay. See you soon.